This video is sponsored by Movie Palette. Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this episode, a host of rock stars including Five Finger Death Punch, Jacoby Shaddix, and Tommy Lee co-star in the horror revenge thriller, The Retaliators. The peaceful life of Pastor John Bishop, played by Michael Lombardi, is shattered when his eldest daughter Sarah, played by Katie Kelly, is murdered by Ram Cady, played by Joseph Gatt, a member of a vicious motorcycle gang. The detective investigating the case, Jed Sawyer, played by Mark Menchaka, offers John the chance to get one minute alone with Ram to do whatever he wants, going beyond the law to do so. As Ram's biker gang, led by his brother Vic, played by Ivan Moody, search for him, will John take the opportunity to seek retribution and step into a horrifying underworld. The Retaliators is the second movie from Better Noise Films, the film offshoot of the rock music label Better Noise Music, which amongst their roster includes Motley Crue, Five Finger Death Punch, Eva Under Fire, Bad Walls, and formerly Papa Roach, almost all of which appear in this movie, either as cameos or as full-fledged supporting roles. The film is directed by Samuel Gonzalez Jr. and Bridget Smith who you'll be completely unsurprised to hear have a long history in directing music videos and this is their second full-length film each although Smith has the more interesting CV in that she actually directed the first Better Noise film an addiction drama called Snow Babies which considering the label that it spawned from seems a little bit off-brand but this is very much on brand. Weirdly, in some places, including the press email I got about this movie, Michael Lombardi, who is the star of this film and also a producer on it, is also listed as a third director, and I don't think that's true. I can't corroborate that, but on the movie itself, only Smith and Gonzalez Jr. are credited, and the same is true for the poster as well, so if Lombardi did work on this movie, he's uncredited on it. The film is written by the Gear Brothers, and this is their debut screenplay. Now, the film did actually premiere last year at Fright Fest, and since then has been touring all around the world, to use a bit of band parlance, at various different film festivals, and now it is finally getting a wide release a worldwide release, in fact, because for one day only, although there does appear to be a couple of encore screenings, it is screening all around the world on September 14th, so that is worth checking out at your local cinema if you're interested, and I presume that it's going to get a digital release a couple of months later. Now, full disclosure, I did actually receive this film from a screener, but they have no input over this review. The Retaliators is clearly meant to be a throwback to 80s exploitation flicks, really going back old school. It's lots of practical gore and effects and all the filth and nastiness that you would expect out of one of those movies. And clearly the filmmakers had a list of genre mainstays that they wanted to homage and fold into this one. The problem with The Retaliators, though, is that it not just feels like several different movies at the same time, it feels like several different movies made by totally different filmmakers that aren't even on speaking terms with one another. And the fact that the film was made by two different directors kind of makes me wonder if different sides of the movie were helmed by different people, and then when they put them together in the edit, they realised that it didn't actually gel together, because the film has no real internal consistency to it. There's no real kind of logic to the shifting of the genres. It just seems to happen on a dime, and the themes and ideas of the movie seems to shift along with it. It's very strange. I went into The Retaliators knowing very little about it going in, aside from the rock star element of it, and as I was watching it, I genuinely thought to myself, I have no idea where this is going, and that wasn't in a good way. It wasn't in a sense of, oh, this is a totally absorbing movie where I'm surprised by what's happening. It's in the sense of, I don't know what film this is trying to be. Like, it's so all over the place, tonally, that it kind of left me at a little bit of a loss. It's the kind of movie where you're thankful for a lengthy horror pre-title sequence, because if it didn't, and it just opened where the story began, you might get the mistaken impression you were watching a pure flicks movie 
instead, in that the first 20 minutes of the movie are largely family melodrama, in that the pastor, rather unfortunately named John Bishop, apparently completely unaware of the British comedian of the same name, he's a single father having to take care of his two daughters after his wife's death, the eldest of which, Sarah, is going to therapy for the trauma of the event. And he's a bit of an uptight, overprotective father, but he wants to keep his daughter safe. And I will say that these opening scenes are actually quite well acted. Michael Lombardi and Katie Kelly both previously appeared in the aforementioned Snow Babies, so it feels like they're picking up where they left off. And Katie Kelly in particular actually quite impressed me with her role as Sarah, even though she doesn't have a lot of screen time because obviously she's doomed, but she manages to make her feel like a person so when the worst inevitably happens to her you feel something about it but Lombardi is also pretty good in the lead role he's probably best known for his work on TV's Rescue Me it's a part that requires him to be a religious pastor a grieving father and an action hero simultaneously and for the most part he manages to pull that off there's a couple of moments where he's required to be at the edge of intensity and he doesn't quite sell it properly and it's a little bit hammy but for the most part he's a reliable solid anchor for the film in a way that the movie itself doesn't properly provide. But the fact that the movie devotes so much of its early screen time to him sermonising and you can tell we're meant to think that he's a cool pastor because he's got a rock band at his services it does make you wonder Am I watching a Christian message movie in disguise? You're not, but the movie still makes you watch the entire lengthy sermon that he delivers, even though the scene that he is describing is literally the one that we've just watched beforehand, because immediately before, there is a major scene, at least from a thematic perspective, in that they're going out Christmas tree shopping, and then some jerk steals the tree from Sarah, and the pastor tries to intervene and try and get the tree back. But of course, because he's got a turn the other cheek policy, he's a pacifist, that fails and the bully tramples all over him. And that scene is clearly meant to be a critique on his failures as a man, especially reinforced by the fact that Sarah talks to him about how much he loves Die Hard and he loves motorbikes, but he's too afraid to actually ride one and he doesn't take charge like an action hero would. And this is obviously very much about kind of masculinity and asserting oneself, which if you're familiar with revenge thrillers is very much on brand for the genre. And this scene at the Christmas tree lot is begging to be intercut with the sermon where he describes it later because having them as two separate scenes renders the second one redundant. But I think the reason they've kept it that way is because Clerks' Brian O'Halloran cameos as the jerk who steals the Christmas tree so they wanted the most amount of screen time. This will be a recurring problem later. But you'll probably notice the fact the movie is set explicitly at Christmas which helps with the 80s throwback vibes because a lot of action and horror films from the period did set themselves at Christmas as an ironic retort to the idea of goodwill to all men and the retaliators takes place in a cruel and cynical world where just beneath domesticity lies a seedy underbelly of violence and brutality and plus it's also another little nod to die hard but of course very quickly the movie shifts gears into being a revenge thriller when Sarah takes the car out to go to a party and she ends up in the wrong place at the wrong time and just happens to pull in to the same gas station as Ram Cady and ends up being pursued and eventually killed by him and this serves as another failure on the pastor's part, another loss that he has failed to protect himself and his family from. But now we get the introduction of Sawyer, the detective on the case, played by Ozark's Mark Menchaka and Menchaka is terrific in this role. He gives a gravitas, this burnt out type that has lost his faith with the law even though he is technically representing it. And he empathises with the pastor because he knows exactly what he's going through. Sawyer has lost everything that he loves and he decides to do something about it. As we see in a very lengthy flashback halfway through the movie. How lengthy do you ask? 
It has a flashback within the flashback. That's how long it goes on for. So Sawyer was previously on a case where he had to track down a kidnapper, abuser, torturer, and murderer of women called Quinn Brady, played by Papa Roach's Jacoby Shaddox. And so he managed to put him behind bars, but then those failures of the law, they decide to release him after just six years. I'm not sure how that happened, considering that when they caught him at the time, he had literally just shotgunned a woman in the face deliberately as they opened the door. I think that's more than enough evidence to put him away for life, but for some reason, he was let out of jail, and of course, predictably, he targets Sawyer's family. And the movie delivers this backstory in incredibly convoluted fashion. There is no reason why it has to be anywhere near as long as it is in this movie. And again, it could have very easily been cross-cut with him exposing it in voiceover. But again, I think because they have Robert John Burke in the movie of Robocop 3 and thinner fame playing one of his fellow officers, it feels like the only reason this flashback is as long as it is, is because they wanted to give as much screen time to a cameo as they possibly could. Again, there is a pattern emerging here. But in this aspect of the movie, there is a germ of an interesting idea in that the pastor is a man of faith who completely loses his way. He becomes absorbed with the idea of revenge and retribution. Very Old Testament. And then he's given this unique opportunity to come face to face with the man who killed his daughter for one minute. And he can do whatever he wants to him so long as he doesn't kill him. And so in that way, he is in a situation where there are no repercussions for his actions aside from the self-knowledge that he has committed this sin and having that on his conscience. And so the question becomes, what would you do if you had something so precious to you cruelly taken away like that and you were given the opportunity to take out all that pain that is on your soul and physically inflict it on the perpetrator and they are totally helpless? Would you consider that to be a cleansing or a healing in some way? Would you get a catharsis out of it? Or would you consider it to be wrong and immoral? And that all sounds very kind of lofty and serious. And that kind of is part of the problem in that, yes, there is actually an intriguing moral dilemma at the center of this movie. But A, the film doesn't really have any interest in following through on this or debating it. But also the other problem is that really the best exploitation movies don't take themselves seriously. They're outrageous and over the top and ridiculous. Those are the fun parts of exploitation films. Whereas The Retaliators really does take itself a bit too seriously and also kind of unpleasant to watch at times, especially because there is so much emphasis on the torture elements. I believe at the film festivals, the filmmakers have actually introduced this as being kind of like the thinking man's version of Hostel, which is really overselling it, in my opinion. But even so, there is an idea here that they could have properly followed through on if they wanted to, and really kind of having the biblical stuff make sense overall. But of course, this movie doesn't want to properly engage with it. It's just an excuse to have more over-the-top violence in the movie. And also, it's the kind of film where overall, the actual message is something along the lines of, even if you are a literal pastor, sometimes you have to stick up for yourself and commit a literal assault by punching someone in the face. Presumably the end credits roll just before he was arrested. But if the movie was solely about that, it would at least feel internally consistent. But unfortunately the movie decides to crunch its genre shift again because it decides the third film it's trying to be simultaneously is a biker movie. There is an entire subplot about Ram's fellow bikers who are trying to work out what the hell has happened to him? He's disappeared in a puff of smoke since this drug deal gone bad with a bunch of money and crystal on him and no one knows where he's gone. So they're trying to track him down. And the only reason this subplot is so prominent in the movie is because Five Finger Death Punch 
play all the bikers, including Ram's brother. So basically, there's a lot of screen time devoted to them storming into completely random locations, roughing people up and going, WHERE'S MY BROTHER? If you're wondering where The Rock was in this rock horror, it's on this side of the movie. And that means that there are just entire scenes devoted to these biker characters wandering into somewhere and they need to find a tracker or something. So they beat up another biker who's played by the lead singer of Ice Nine Kills and so on and so forth. They go into a strip club so that we can have some completely gratuitous nudity and scenes of people doing blow. And the DJ at the strip club is Motley Crue's Tommy Lee, also known for getting his willy out on Instagram. And all of these scenes set up plot points that go completely and totally nowhere. Like Robert Nepper turns up as the VP of the biker gang who gives them orders. And he has this really long mold about all the different charters. They're all in uproar. They're all converging to air and they're all trying to find Ram and the money and the crystal. So they need to be the ones that find him first so that he can punish him alive. But everything that is set up in that scene is totally irrelevant to how the movie actually plays out in the long term. In fact, it's pretty much forgotten as soon as the scene ends. The only reason it's there is because Nepper provides a cameo, so they wanted to keep it in the movie. He never reappears again after that scene. It just goes nowhere and so many of these scenes are like that they just introduce famous person on screen why are they there because they're there i guess the money in the crystal that are so prominently spoken about get no resolution at the end of the movie there is not even like a passing mention of what's happened to that it's just totally and completely forgotten about and this is a problem that i actually see in a lot of rookie first time writing and the gear brothers clearly didn't know where their focus was actually going to be so the movie either needed a total rewrite or a total re-edit to get rid of all these indulgences these scenes don't need to be in the movie if they don't actually contribute to the main plot. And the weird thing is, the movie oscillates between this grief-stricken revenge actioner and all this biker stuff with heavy metal music slathered over it. And of course, when it comes to the music, much of it is tracks from the label. That just adds to the tonal disrepancy of the movie because we're having these emotional scenes with this grief-stricken father and it's backed with heavy metal music over it. Like, the movie doesn't know what it wants to be most of the time. And then when it finally does, you just go, wait, what? The third act of this movie is completely and totally bonkers. In fact, if they hadn't spoiled it in the opening pre-title sequence, this would have come so completely out of left field that it would have been like a malignant-style gonzo twist. It's that divorced from the entire rest of the movie beforehand. Suddenly, after about an hour of being a revenge thriller, the film decides, you know what it's actually going to be? The Hills Have Eyes with Shades of Mandy. Like... Where has this suddenly come from? Suddenly a bunch of mutants are running rampage in the woods. They've all been released and they're all various different criminals that have been so badly tortured that they've lost any semblance of their humanity. And so they're just running around feral, attacking people on sight. And Lombardi turns into the film's Bruce Campbell because he has to kill every single one of them. Yeah, you remember the whole stuff about him being a Christian? Oh, I can't do harm arm on to others well forget all that because suddenly in the last section of the movie he's like i'm gonna ride a motorbike i'm gonna decapitate people and i'm gonna shoot people and it's all gonna squirt blood in my face the film is painted in crimson for the last half hour and full credit to the effects team because those practical effects they are pretty gnarly they do work pretty well but also you just wonder like where has this movie suddenly appeared from that understands the true appeal of an exploitation film? Like, this kind of trash is what makes those kind of movies fun, but it's preceded by an hour of grim, super serious posturing. It's very, very odd. But Victor Gatt is also very solid as the movie's villain Ram. He's wickedly evil, as you would expect. He's got a great look about him. You probably recall him from roles in Game of Thrones, or in Tim Burton's Dumbo. Here, 
It's pretty clear that they cast him on the basis that he looks a lot like Michael Berryman in The Hills Have Eyes. He's pretty much doing that kind of performance. And he particularly seems to be having fun as the film reaches its climax in probably the only way it can. Namely a knockdown, full-on, no-holds-barred brawl between the pastor and Ram, covered in sweat and blood. And each of them seems to be trying to see which one has the bigger pair of balls to kill the other. I suppose for all the changes in tone, at least one thing is thematically consistent. Hyper-masculinity to the point of homoeroticism. The Retaliators is a mess of a movie that's trying to be so many different horror influences it struggles to find its own identity. I guess it does towards the end but that's still two-thirds of the way through when really it should have done that kind of shift about halfway through but it's bogged down by cameos and guest appearances that don't really add to the movie overall. I think that it does at times nail the exploitation vibe that it's going for and Splatterhouse will certainly appreciate the practical effects in the movie and I guess if you're a rock fan this will have significant curiosity value. I do wonder if this is the kind of movie that probably plays a little bit better with an audience especially a rowdy midnight screenings-esque crowd that are just there for the most outrageous stunts and moments and the shifts in tone and probably aren't asking itty bitty questions like who or what are the retaliators of the title referring to? You've probably seen this swish thing in the background of the entire video. This is a movie palette. It takes the colour tone of an entire movie and turns it into this artwork. So each of these lines represents a scene or sequences from the entire movie. In this case, this is Terminator 2 Judgment Day. And if you would like a movie palette of your own, then you can go to moviepalette.com and use the code FILMBRAIN15 to get 15% off your order. And thanks again to Movie Palette for sponsoring this video. If you like this review and you want to support my work, you can give me a tip at my Ko-fi page or with YouTube's Super Thanks feature right below the video. Or you can buy some of my band merch over at my T Public page. Or you can rock on over at my Patreon, where you can see my reviews early among other perks, including access to my Discord server. But until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out.